All right, all right, all right today. We're so glad you're here, whether you're here in the building or you're watching online. We're so excited to have you tuning in as we come to the Word of the Lord together. We have several in the building today, of course, and then we have people watching all around the different parts of the United States. We receive letters from different ones that are watching from Texas and Florida and even other countries. And so today, uh, we thank you that you're tuning in with us, and we hope that you draw near. Are you ready to grow in your now faith? Are you ready for that? Come on, let me hear you today if you're ready for the Word of the Lord. All right, today we are going to continue our series called Now Faith. Our faith should always be growing. Is that a true statement? Yes, we learned this last week that faith is something that should always be growing in every believer's life. And that God says he gives us a measure of faith. So some he gave five, some he gave two, some he gave one. And each one is given a measurement of faith, Scripture says. It's different. The question isn't, isn't how much faith you have. The question is this, what am I doing with the faith I've been given? That's where we're called to be accountable. What am I doing to grow the faith I have now? And maybe this will be a small, little mustard seed of faith, but the question is, how am I steering that? How am I growing that? It's up to me to grow your faith. And today, I talked about growing your faith last week, and today I want to continue in that process of teaching you how to grow your faith. How to grow your faith. Because we should always be growing our faith. So turn to your neighbor and say, let's grow together. All right, let's go today. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, our text. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us. And let's say this word that's highlighted together. And let us run with endurance. Come on, let's say it together. Endurance, the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Now today, we're called to run this race with endurance. And how many know endurance is not something that just happens overnight? It's kind of like when we decide, all right, man, I just went and got a new gym membership. I went and got some new workout clothes. I went and bought some new workout shoes. And you're three days before, come on, you're posting on social media, getting back into shape. I can't wait to start. This is going to be my day. And you're, you're posting about it like three days in a row. Oh, this is going to be so awesome. And then you get to the gym and 15 minutes into your exercise, you're like, oh, this hurts. This burns. I can't breathe. Something happened. I got old overnight. What happened to me? My body is aching already. And why? Because we have not built up endurance. See, endurance is something that is built little by little, day by day. No one wakes up with endurance. See, you got to build it up. It's something you build up to. And we're called to run this race with endurance. It's a faith race. It's a race about our faith. And it's about growing in endurance in our faith. It's small, little steps every day. See, faith doesn't grow overnight. It grows in the small steps every single day. And it says that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, the author is at the start. He authors our salvation. We connect with Jesus when we accept him as our Lord and Savior. He becomes the author, the starter of our faith. The question is this, do we let him become the finisher of our faith? See, we don't have a problem with him being the author, the starter. It's the finisher that we struggle in. It's the letting him come every day and begin to finish the work that he started at salvation. He wants to finish the work that he started at salvation in our life, and it's a thing of endurance. So he becomes the author and the finisher. But for many people, he's just the author. He has to become that person of finishing our faith. We know that faith is the key to unlocking the promises of blessing that God has for our life. As I operate in that endurance, as I operate in faith, it unlocks the door for the promises of God to be fulfilled in my life. So I must know this and answer this question. How 
do I see God? How do you see God? You have to answer that question for yourself. Because how you see God will determine his being the finisher of your faith. For many people, God is just the the man upstairs. The good old boy upstairs. Or maybe he's the God of the Christmas baby in the manger. Maybe he's the resurrected Savior that we celebrate on Easter once a year. Who is God to you? Because that will determine the amount of faith that you walk in in your life. And let me be very clear. God is much more than the man upstairs. It makes great country music lyrics. But it's bad in theology because he's more than just the man upstairs. He is the author and the finisher of my faith. That means he started my faith and he's with me to the very end. He's just not hiding upstairs. No, he's walking with me day by day. He is living with me day by day. And if I will tune in and learn to build my faith, I can walk in this incredible relationship with the author and the finisher of my faith. So how I see God determines my level of faith and how it grows. Look what Mark 6 says in verses 3 and 6. This is a story we read a couple weeks ago, and I think it's so important to highlight again today. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, and Judah, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him, and Jesus said to them, My prophet is not without honor except in his own town among his own relatives and in his own home. And it says he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty hard for Jesus to be amazed. We don't see it a lot in Scripture. But one of the things we see that amazed Jesus was the lack of faith. He's like, how can you people have a lack of faith? I go to other countries, I go to other towns, other villages, they accept me, they're receiving the gospel, they're receiving the word of Christ. He goes, and their lives are being changed, and I come back to my hometown, and they're like, man, that's the guy who built our kitchen table. That's the that's that's the guy we played kickball with in the street growing up. That's the that's the kid around the block. And they didn't see him as the Messiah, but couldn't get past the carpenter's son. And so it says that he would not do, he could not do, he, and some versions even say he chose not to do any great works there except for a few small things because of their lack of faith. So when I choose to make him the author but not the finisher, that means I'm walking my life without the author working in my life every day. He dwells where faith abides. He works where faith abides. Where faith is walking it out, the author will be up to finishing my faith right there. That's where he wants to be. And so I've got to make a choice. I've got to make a choice every day and say, I'm going to walk in faith. Every day I want to take another small step of faith. I choose to believe. See, it's possible for people here today for me to preach this message, to be in service, and somebody on the second row to really receive a great blessing of the Lord. And they'll send me a message. Man, that, was, that message spoke right to me. Man, I received a healing in this area of my life during the service. Worship was so incredible. And then other people on the same row could not experience anything that powerful. Why is it? Because somebody came in faith. Because somebody was expecting. Somebody let faith arise in their heart. God, I'm seeking you today. God, I believe you're going to be here today. God, I believe you got my healing today. God, I believe you're going to grow my life today. God, I believe you're going to change my life today. Faith opens the door for God to move. And when I don't bring the faith, God chooses not to operate there. That's why different ones can experience different things because different ones are opening their life up to faith. That's why I challenge you every week, come expecting. Come expecting God to move. Come expecting God to change your life. Come expecting God to fill your life. Come expecting to be renewed in the presence of God. Come expecting the Holy Spirit to fill you fresh and anew. Come expecting God to speak something fresh out of his word to your life. Faith, it moves God. See, there's two things we see 
that really moved Jesus. We see two things in Scripture. One was compassion, and the other was faith. Many times in Scripture, you'll see where Jesus, his physical man, was tired. He can you think about this. He's teaching, and as he's teaching, people are coming, and the multitudes, or the crowds are constantly pressuring to get to him. Jesus, touch my baby. Jesus, bless my child. Jesus, touch my friend. Jesus, heal my body. And they're, they're growing. They want to hear the word that's alive. They want to see the miracles. They want to experience the miracles. They want a blessing. And so the crowds are pushing him. I mean, we even see stories where people were sneaking into Jesus' tent in the middle of the night. Waking him up in the middle of the darkest hour of night. He's trying to sleep and people are knocking. Hey, Jesus, can I have a word with you? I mean, that's what was going on constantly. And so Jesus was tired. And we see times in Scripture where Jesus said, all right, he's trying to slip away and get a little rest. He was trying to leave the crowd and get a little solitude. And it says, as he did, people would follow him outside of town. They would follow him to his place of rest. And it says that Jesus moved with compassion. And he would touch them and heal them. And he would keep on ministering way beyond what his physical body felt like doing. Because he was moved with compassion. If you don't know this about our Savior, you need to know this today. Jesus is full of compassion today. It was compassion that let him leave heaven and come down to earth. It was compassion that allowed himself to be nailed to the cross for our sins. It was compassion that moves the heart of Jesus. But also we see another thing that moves Jesus. It's our faith. Our faith moves Jesus' heart. Look at that in Scripture. I dare you to go back into the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and read how many times that Jesus was either moved by compassion or moved by someone's faith. It's a great read. You would love that study because we see where people would come to him. Like one soldier came to him and said, I need you to, to heal one of my workers. And Jesus said, all right, let's go. And he goes, no, 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 you're busy, man. But I understand authority. If you'll just say the word, he'll be healed right now. You don't even have to go. And it says, Jesus was blown away with his faith. That this man understood Jesus, the spiritual authority, that all he had to do was say the word. It says that Jesus was moved with his faith. And we see this time and time again where he healed people who he was moved with their faith. Our faith moves the heart of God. Are you seeing a pattern here? He is moved by compassion and he's moved by our faith. So I want God to move. I want the author to move in my life and become the finisher of my faith. So I've got to move in faith in my life, which invites God to continue to finish what he started in my life. How does that happen? Revelation 12, 11. I love this scripture. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Listen, we have power, spiritual authority given to us by what Jesus did on the cross. That's the blood of the lamb. But also today we have power by building our faith, by sharing our testimony. This is how faith grows in our life. If God has ever done anything for you, then you need to share it with somebody. Don't keep it to yourself. The more you share it, you're helping somebody else and then you're building your own faith as well. It works hand in hand. I'm building somebody else's faith and I'm building my faith. If God has ever saved you, you need to tell somebody. If God has ever healed you, you need to tell somebody. If God's ever restored a relationship in your life, you need to tell somebody. If God's returned home your children you've been praying for, tell somebody. I'm telling you, we overcome. Faith is built up by the word of our testimony. Look at the scripture here in 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Casting down the arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's important. Bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, we see something here that we're called to cast down anything that stops us from growing in the knowledge of the author. Anything that stops me from growing in the knowledge of God, I have a personal responsibility to cast that down. In a case you need me to get out the Greek and the Hebrew and tell you exactly what casting down means, it means you are given spiritual authority to pick up and body slam anything 
Come on now, casting down. Think about that, casting down. It ain't, it ain't like a, ah, oh, bless you. Down. No, casting down. Pick that thing up and slam it. Get it out of your life. Anything that stops me from growing in the knowledge of the author. Anything that stops me from getting to church and hearing the word of God, I gotta get that thing out of my life, out of my family's life. Anything that stops me from hearing the word of God, anything that stops me from growing in God, get that thing out. Body slam that thing out of there. Get it out of your life. Cast it down and let the knowledge of God grow because as the knowledge of God grows, so does my faith level as well. Somebody say amen to that. It's growing in my faith. See, look at this statement. The strength of our faith will be determined by the reliability of the object we put our faith in. Let's look at that one more time. The strength of our faith will be determined by the reliability of the object we put our faith in. Let me explain it to you this way. How many have kids in the house? Raise your hand right now. You have kids in your house, so you're going to understand what I'm about to tell you. I've had five kids. My two youngest are seniors in high school, so I, we've gotten through those hard, hard years there. Now, ever so often, my kids will come and say, Dad, can we go to a friend's house? Can we go play video games at a friend's house or basketball or go hang out and do this or that? I'm like, sure, but before you go, make sure you go upstairs and clean your room, put your laundry away, and pick your clothes up out of the bathroom. Okay, no problem. And they go back upstairs and I have one child who will come down the stairs and I'll say, did you do what I asked you to do? It's all done, Dad. And I'll say, all right, have a good time. High five, yeah. Be careful. Text me when you get there. I don't have to worry about it. I know they've done what I've asked them to do. Now I have another child. They'll come down the stairs and I'll say, wait, 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 wait. Where are you going? I did what you told me. Well, let's go, let's go check it together. And I know when I get up there that about half of it will be done. I get up there, you made your bed nice and you started to clean your room, but go ahead and take that laundry and put it inside. In, in, see those drawers? They were made to hold your clothes. The dresser was not made to stack it up. It was made to hold your clothes. So put it in those drawers. Those drawers pull out and you can actually stuff clothes in there and shut it and they can't see them. It's magic. I'm telling you, it happens. And go ahead and pick up those clothes you didn't get. Okay, okay, Dad. They come back down the stairs. Is it done? Yeah, yeah. All right, have a good time. High five, text it when you get there. And I have other kids that I just hear them stepping toward the stairs. And I go, wait. Don't even bother coming down them stairs. I know you haven't even touched that room since I told you last. I know you took a blanket and threw it over your bed and walked out of that room and didn't look another second second thought. Go back up there and make that bed. Put those clothes away and kick those laundry up off the floor like I told you. And don't even think of coming downstairs until it's done. I don't even have to double check. I know it hasn't been touched. See, faith is determined by the reliability of the person you have it in. And some people I've got strong faith in, and others I've learned I haven't got strong faith yet in them, okay? It's still trying to build. But see, we can determine this, that our God will not fail us. Our God is someone we can put our faith in. He is reliable. He will not leave us nor forsake us. He's the one that we can grow our faith in. See, our faith will grow when our knowledge of God grows. The more I understand about the author, oh man, the more my faith grows, the more I understand how big his mercy and grace is for my life, oh, the more I want to know more about this author. Everybody else, they'll, they'll throw stones, they'll throw words, they'll talk about me behind my back, but this one, he gave his life for me that while I was yet a sinner, he ran to me, he came to me, he accepted me. He forgave me. He put me back into right standing with God. When nobody else would do it, this man did it. He's the author of my faith. He said, I would never leave you. I would never forsake you. He is there with us. He is the author. Romans 10, 17. What did he author? It says our faith grows by hearing and hearing by the word of God. My faith will grow when I hear the word of God. Why? Because that's what the author of my faith wrote. Are you seeing it? 
the author of my faith, wrote the book of the Bible. All these Bibles were inspired. Holy Spirit breathed. The, he authored it through the Holy Spirit. He is the author of my faith. And he has authored what? Well, the more I hear what the author has to say about me, the more I hear what the author is going to do in my life, the more I hear the plan of the author in my life, the more my faith grows. He's the author and the finisher of my faith. Grow my faith by knowing what the author has to say. So today I want to close and give you four foundations of faith. Four faith foundations. I want you to write these down. These are going to help you grow. Very practical. I want you to write them down. Number one, you, you must believe that God exists. You must believe. It's a foundation. You must believe that God exists. I know it sounds elementary, but it's the foundation of our faith is believing that he is and he is this. 11, Hebrews eleven six says it like this. But without faith, it's impossible to believe, to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that what? He is. Everybody say he is. See, I must believe he is. Not that he was or not that he shall be. I got to believe that he is. He is a present tense God. Now faith is our God. We must believe that he is today in charge. I must believe today he is the author of my faith. I must believe today he is the finisher of my faith. I must believe today. He said, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh. He says, who do I tell him? He said, you tell him I am that I am. He didn't tell him I was that I was or I shall be. He said, you tell him I'm the present tense God. You must believe that God is presently active today. This is where faith grows. Romans 1.20 says it like this. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power can, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Let me interpret this for you. He says there is no excuse not to believe in God. He goes, how can you walk outside and look at nature and not believe there is a God? That if we walk outside today and the sun's out, and if that sun was any more closer to the earth, we'd all burn up and die. And if that sun was any more further away, we'd all freeze up and die. But it's exactly where it needs to be so that we get the proper heat when we need it, the proper light when we need it, that they get the proper growth when we need it. He says, how can you imagine that the clouds go and they, they collect moisture and they bring it back to you and they water the fields and they water the crops and your body, which is made of 70% water, cannot survive without water. And I, I bring it to you. I pump it to you. I make it come to you. Those things didn't just happen because a bang happened. Those things didn't just happen because they fell into place. I'm telling you, there's a God who is the creator. He is the author of creation. He says, how can you not look at the birds of the field and the animals of the field and see each other? How can you not study the DNA of your body and realize that every one of us have got a unique DNA that identifies us personally, that the nerve endings in the, the vessels and the veins in our bodies go on for miles and miles. Can you think about that? Inside each one of us, complex nature. Those things didn't just happen because a couple of molecules crashed out in space. He says, there's a God of order. He goes, you got to understand that. I mean, can you imagine if a big bang happened because a couple of molecules hit it and everything just fell into order? What would have happened if my arm would have landed right here on my head? Or my lips landed? Well, let's just think about it today. He's a God of order. Things didn't just land by accident where they needed to be. He's a God of order. He created the order. He spoke in the order. I remember one time I had a guy come to me and said, he goes, Pastor, I just want you to know right away, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. And I stuck out my hands and said, sir, it's such a privilege to meet you today. I've never met someone with so much faith. And he got taken back. I just told you, I'm not a man of faith. I don't believe in God. 
I said, I know you don't believe in God, but in my opinion, sir, it takes a lot more faith to believe there's not a God than there is a God. He goes, what do you mean? I said, if we took this watch and I broke it up into a, a bunch of pieces with a hammer and I put it in the bag and we shook it up for a thousand years and then we open it up and put it on the table, is that watch going to be put back together? He goes, no. I said, even something as simple as the watch has a maker, how much more complex is, are you and I? How much more complex is my mind and brain and the nature? There was an author to our faith. There was a creator to our faith. And I want you to know today, he says, there is no excuse not to know that God exists. You cannot have a half a brain and look out and understand something created something, that things just don't come out of nothing. But there was an artist. He was the author of creation and he put it into existence with a spoken word i'm telling you he's the god he is the author of our faith and we must believe that he exists you say do you believe in evolution i believe that things can evolve over time i believe that species evolve over time i believe that we change according to climate and according to races as we mix and we have children things things will evolve over time but it, wasn't, it didn't happen out of evolution. Well, what about, we came from, well, why are there still monkeys? Why are the monkeys still monkeys and we're still here? I know you ever talk about, I didn't come from a monkey. I came from an author. I'm telling you, he was the author of my faith. If that be true, why are all monkeys growing? Well, I see a few out here today. You're laughing at me. All right. I'm telling you, he is the God of our creator. There is no excuse. You must believe that he exists. And number two, you must believe that God does not change. God does not change. You must believe this. Hebrews 13, 8 makes it very clear. It says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's say it together. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change. You've got to let that build your faith up today. He is the same God. If he did it for Moses, he can do it for you. If he did it for Abraham and Sarah, he can do it for you. If he did it for Jonah, he can do it for you. If he did it for David, he can do it for you. If he did it for Ruth and Naomi, he can do it for you. If he did it for Peter, Peter and Paul, he can do it for you. If he can do it for Silas in the prison, he can do it for you. I'm here to tell you today, he's the same God today, yesterday and forever. I'm telling you, our God does not change. Today, if you've ever been healed, if God has ever miraculously healed you, stand up right now. I want to see you. Stand up if God has ever healed you of something in your life. Come on, look around you. If God can, listen to me, if God can do it for them, he can do it for you. Come on now today. I want you to know if God can do it for them, he can do it for you. I've been there. I've been there in a living room when they came home and said, Gene, we got to tell you something. I was 12 years old. They said, your mom is not going to make it more than three months but I believed I went to that church where they would call on the elders and they would surround and they would pray for people and they prayed for my mom and she's still alive today. I'm telling you today, God is the miracle working God. I have faith today. Why? Because if he did it for them, he can do it for me. How many today, if you've ever experienced God doing a miracle in your finances, that you had a financial miracle happen, just stand to your feet right now. Let me see you. Stand across. If that happened to you, look around you. Wow. Listen to me today. If God did it for them, he can do it for you. If he did it back then, he can do it again today. Come on, let faith arise in your heart. Sit down today. How many ask you this question? How many has ever had God heal a relationship in your life. If God's ever restored a broken relationship, stand up right now that God did a miracle in a relationship. Look around here. Come on now. Look at this. Look at this. Let me tell you this right now. If God did it for them, he can do it for you. God wants to do a miracle in your life. I want you to hear it today. God wants to do a miracle in your life. Come on today. If you need a miracle, stand up right now. I'm going to pray for you even when you're standing. Stand up. You need God to do a miracle in your life right now. Stand to your feet. Raise your hands right now. I'm going to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus. Jesus, you are still the miracle working God. 
God, you are the still the miracle working God. And those who are standing up in the auditorium today, those who are raising their hand online today as they listen, God, I pray right now that you do a miracle. God, I pray right now that, that the blood of Jesus, Lord, would cover these people. God, right now, by the authority of your stripes, I pray healing. Those who need a relationship restored, may they be restored in Jesus' name. Those who need a financial miracle, God, I pray that God, a miracle will happen, Father, in Jesus' name. God, if you did it for them, you can do it again. God, we believe it today. May faith arise. It's a now faith that you do exist today, and we give you praise. Come on, give God a hand clap. Woo! All right, I'm going to quickly give you two more things. Sit down. We're going to close this thing out. The positions are coming. We're going to close this thing out. Uh, number three, I must believe that God does not lie. Come on now. Turn to your neighbor and say, God doesn't lie. Come on now. You, some of you have been raised by a deadbeat dad who told you he was going to be there and he never showed up. He said, I would show up and he didn't show up. And you've been carrying around that in your heart. I'm here to tell you today, God is wanting to set you free today because our God is not a deadbeat God. He does not lie. If he said he would be there, he will be there. If he said, I will never leave you, he won't leave you. He's going to be right there with you. you got to believe that in your heart. Hebrews 6, 17 says it like this. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what he promised. He confirmed it with an oath. God made an oath that God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. Are you hearing me? There's only one thing that's impossible for God, and that's the lie. Everything else is possible. He will not, he will not lie to us. And number four, I must believe in his ability. I must believe in his ability. I must believe that God can. I love it when Abraham and Sarah received the promise of the Lord. And remember Sarah was like, we kind of have kids. This, this guy you gave me, this husband of mine, he's old. And I know by experience, we ain't, we ain't having no kids. She goes, I know he's too old and I'm old. We're way past our childbearing years and you're saying we're going to have a son. And God asked Sarah this question. He said, is there anything too hard for God? And I want us to say it together. Come on, let's say it together. Let's repeat this. Is there anything too hard for God? Come on, let's say it again. Is there anything too hard for God. One more time. Is there anything too hard for God? And the answer is no. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. Amen.